next uh, humanity webinar that we're doing. And so, whoops, come back. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for joining. Now the agenda is really short. I've got you know ten slides to to share, and then we'll do a Q and A. Um, and there is on the on the bottom tray if you're on if you're on the desktop, it, there's a little button. It's a Q and A button beside uh, chat and participants, so you can jump in there and ask questions. But you can also upvote questions. So we always have about two to three times more questions than I can get to um, in in an hour. And so what I need you to do is make sure that you upvote the questions that you want answered, because then we'll get kind of the most birds with the with the fewest stones. Um, OK, so with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump on in. So I've mentioned in a couple videos and a lot of you have pointed out in chat, um, the, you know, the fourth turning. Um, people have talked about it for a while on the on the comments and then people have talked about it in Discord. And I finally started listening to this book and I was I was skeptical at first. I was really resistant, but. Um, kind of a rule that I have is if if you get if you get recommended something three times, you should probably read it. Um, it you know, three separate people, and it's been like a dozen. So I'm finally finally reading it, and I really appreciate the way that this book is structured. Now, I will say that I'm a little bit still skeptical, but it is a good pattern. Um, and as as a pattern seeker, as a systems thinker, I recognize a lot of the theory that goes into this. And so the high level, if you're not familiar with the fourth turning, it's a generational theory that basically says that there's kind of four phases um, and four archetypes in terms of how people come come up in the world. And so the 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 generations are hero, artist, prophet, nomad. And so the hero generation, the last hero generation was the greatest generation or the GI generation. So this was the generation that fought and won in World War II followed by the artists, which was the silent generation. So this was like the younger siblings of the of the people who grew up um, in kind of the shadow and the aftermath of World War II, followed by the boomers who were, you know, in the, the post-war boom. They were born at that time and came up during the civil rights movement and that sort of thing. And then finally, uh, Gen X and millennials, uh, you know, came came afterwards. So Gen X was kind of the last generation of that cycle. And now millennials are when the cycle is restarting. And so one way to think of it is that there's this kind of Newtonian equal and opposite reaction to your childhood. And in some cases, it's a matter of uh, reacting to the excesses or the problems of your childhood. And so one of the ways to think about this is the, the greatest generation, the GI generation, they, um, you know, they were all about structure and institution and conformity. So the reason that McDonald's is the same everywhere is because food chains we're like, oh, well, we're gen we're we're general infantry, and so we're we want the same experience everywhere we go, um, and so that's like why food chains really took off in the fifties and sixties, and then of course the the uh, boomers that grew up under that, they've been rebelling against power structures and trying to deconstruct power structures ever since, and there's a lot of nuance. Uh, obviously, can't can't unpack an entire book um, in one slide. Uh, but the each each of these four archetypes is associated with four phases. So there's the crisis phase, which was World War II and right now. Then there's the high, which was like the 50s and the post-war boom. And the next one will be starting in the next five years or so. And then followed by an awakening. So that was the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the swinging 60s. And then followed by an unraveling, which is, you know, Reaganism, neoliberalism, basically the cyberpunk era of the 1980s until about the 2008 recession was kind of the uh, the the opening shot of the crisis era. So that's the fourth turning. And the reason that I'm bringing this up, it follows very, very closely with uh, the, the book that I read just before this, which was Ray Dalio's uh, Navigating or Principles of Navigating a Debt Crisis. Now, Ray Dalio is a sharp guy. He's very wealthy, but oh my God, he needed to hire an editor. He wrote the thing himself and he spends so much time declaiming and saying, I'm not an expert in this, but this is what I think. He said, he repeats that phrase, like, I, I kid you not, like 500 times in the book. And I'm like, dude, hire an editor. Anyways, but he did his homework. He hired, I, apparently he spent like $100 million researching the, to get the data for this book or something. I don't know if that's true. I heard it on a podcast. Um, but anyways, so you look at the timing of this. So the last major debt spike was in the 30s. As as FDR, just after FDR became president, and he was trying to stem the bleeding of the Great Depression. And so you see this downward slide as as the debt cycle is coming to an end. You've got deleveraging and then you've got World War II. We have a little bit more debt again. 
And then you have this long, gradual upslope. So you have Reaganomics here in the 80s where you see the debt just kind of really spiking and then it kind of keeps growing up until 2008, which was the last crisis. And then we've been deleveraging since. So if you look at this timing, we are about here-ish. We're about in 1940 in terms of in if this debt cycle continues, which means we're right on time for another crisis. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a world war, but it's looking like it could be. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So this is just one bit of data that Ray Dalio puts out. Oh, and by the way, this PDF is available for free on, on the internet. I can post links to that. Uh, Ray Dalio, like his, his entire mission is he wants to share all this information as far and wide as possible because he wants to stop this cycle or at least make it not as bad. So this is another way of looking at this debt cycle. And it's a little bit confusing, but it's about total, jet, total debt as a percentage of GDP and debt servicing as a percentage of GDP. And so there's like, you know, the yield curves and all those sorts of things, but he breaks it into these cycles. So you've got the bubble, you've got the top, then you've got a depression, and then the, the beautiful deleveraging, which I don't know why he calls it beautiful deleveraging in this. He didn't call it that in, in the book that I read. Um, it's really a kind of a painful deleveraging. And so the the top, you know, this is like when yuppie culture was at the peak in the 80s and 90s. And so then ever since the dot-com revolution and crash and the 2008 recession, that was about here. So we're just after that. And we're getting to a, a breaking point. And so this is why you constantly see um, you know, the senators arguing over like raising the debt ceiling. And it's like, well, what are we going to do? Basically, they're playing a game of economic chicken. As best as I can tell, all the politicians know what's coming. They know that they're just kicking the can down the road. And eventually there's going to be something that just forces us to adopt an entirely new economic paradigm. And I think what they're hoping is that artificial intelligence and other technologies will help us just inflate out of the, that pattern. So I know this is all very technical, um, but it's just, you know, pay attention to the graphs. Um, and if you don't like, I barely get it. So I could be, I could be uh, explaining it incorrectly, but so here's, here's kind of the best way that I've found of looking at it. So if you overlay, if you overlay the fourth turning with Ray Dalio's debt cycle, you say, okay, crisis era. So, you know, we had, we had the, the, you know, um, the stock market crash, the great depression, and that was literally like over a decade of, it was, I think it was about 12 years, 12 to 14 years, depending on, excuse me, how you measure it. And, um, so then that was a crisis era. So there's an economic crisis followed by, you know, and this was this, the world war one to world war two, that was global crisis and it was worse in other nations. And so then you have this this huge shakeup where nobody is happy. So no one's happy in Europe. Nobody's happy in America. Um, nobody's happy in the uh, in the Pacific East. And so you have this huge paradigm shattering set of wars. And then you have Bretton Woods, and you have the United Nations, and you have NATO. And so because everything that has that was broken and shook loose, a whole bunch of new institutions were created. So that's when you get the, the growth of the 50s and 60s and 70s, and everyone's just like, man, we've got 30 years straight of good times. And then over, over time, though, you see those oscillations get worse and worse. And so then you have you know the peak with the Reaganomics. And the, so, oh, another thing to point out, the 60s and 70s, this is the awakening era. So that's when you have like civil rights movement and, and women's movement in the swinging 60s. So this is the most like uh, like most religious and sexually and racially permissive uh, period of time. And then you have this deleveraging or not deleveraging, the unraveling starting. So this is why, you know, this is when the, the Gen X was coming, coming of age. So they came of age as things already kind of started downward. And then us millennials, so my first job started right here. And then I immediately lost my job after six months. Um, and I was actually homeless for about a month um, until my brother had me move in with me. So that was the beginning of my career as a millennial. So like all the other millennials, we are very, very cynical about the establishment and all the assumptions that our, our elders, all the Gen X and boomers um, that are in policy and politics are telling us because it's like, you guys clearly don't know what's going on. And so the the echo repeats. So we're in a crisis era, and you see it just started to take back off again, but it it it's not smooth. It's fits and starts, right? And so this is kind of like, all right, 
well, what happens next? What's coming? And I've got a slide about that. Uh, but first, we want to fully unpack what is the current crisis that we're facing as a human species across the entire world. So first is geopolitical unraveling. There is the Middle East. So that's the Israel, Hamas, Iran, Arabia, and other North Africa. So like the Houthis um, and, and all that. So that entire block of the world is in bad shape. And it seems like it could get worse, um, especially because there's a lot of people pouring fuel on the fire, namely Iran. Um, and America, to be honest, like we're not we're not really helping. There has been some news lately where both Iran and America have signaled that they really don't want to have an active war. But we keep trading, you know, shots across the bow with drones. Um, so with any luck, that will stay as a low intensity kind of tit for tat thing. But it's entirely possible that it's going to escalate um, outside of our control, namely because of, uh, you know, all all of basically <laughs> There's so many pieces on the board all in that one area. Then you have Eurasia. So you have Russia, Ukraine, Europe, and NATO. I don't know if you guys have seen, but Poland and others and Germany are all like bracing for a Russian invasion. And I'm like, I don't see it. But again, you know, I'm, I'm listening to uh, well-connected people in the defense industry, um, in the intel industry. And, you know, you look at the spending. A lot of people in NATO are jacking up their their military spending. So I don't see that Russia has the power to do an invasion. I mean, not not a serious invasion, but they could cause some cause some pain. Uh, but this you you see like all the people joining NATO, like Sweden joining NATO and those sorts of things. So you're you're really kind of rallying around um, and kind of bracing for whatever's coming. Now, even if Europe or even if Russia um, is not necessarily a serious threat to all of Europe. That doesn't mean that it can't cause some some real severe pain and heartache because they also are nuclear armed and Putin is who knows what Putin's real motivations are. Um, so that's that's that quarter of the world. But then you also have Asia Pacific, which is primarily the tension between America and China. But then you also throw in Japan, Australia, Korea, um, North Korea. And there's a lot of tension in that region as well. And uh, now, of course, this looks very similar to World War One and World War Two. You have basically the same axes. Now, what about the global south? South America and Africa, not really going to be major battlegrounds, I don't think. North Africa, possibly. Um, but again, it's, it's, these are the three, three main axes. And also, you have to remember that most of the human population is in the northern hemisphere. Um, now, with that being said, I, I did see that Guyana is about to be invaded by, what is it, Venezuela? I don't remember, um, but there is there is some uh, some tension happening um, in South America. Now, domestically within America, we're looking at a financial uh, crisis. So that's the debt cycle that I was just talking about, followed by by deleveraging. We're entering spiritual crises, so it's relatively bleak right now. Um, some people are rallying around. So you see this in particularly in politics, where a lot of uh, hardline you know Christian nationalists are really doubling down. They're going as hard as they can. Because they think that enforcing, you know, their their particular their one worldview with politics is going to save us spiritually. That's not how it's going to play out. Um, but but again, the 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 and I'll talk about the tightening of the status game in just a second. But then also technology. Technology is fundamentally going to reshape our social and economic landscape in the same way that the first, second, and third industrial revolution intrinsically reshaped everything. Um, now, I've talked extensively about postmodernism and nihilism, so I probably don't need to, to rehash that because that's not new information. This other stuff is new information. Um, but I, what I will say is that the, the confluence of environmental nihilism, political nihilism, and then economic nihilism, um, that is, that's a pretty toxic mixture. Um, and that's part of what, what our generation and younger uh, millennials and Gen Z are fed up with. And eventually, enough is enough. And so that's kind of what's coming is, is this kind of enough is enough. Um, and, you know, I don't know how bad it's going to get, but I think that the next five years we'll see. Um, so speaking of the next five years, uh, everything based on, based on the, both the fourth turning and uh, Ray Dalio's long-term debt cycle, it looks like it's all going to come to a head before night, uh, before not 1930, before 2030. Um, uh, the, the fourth turning, he predicts 2026, at least in the original book. I just saw that there's a, you know, the fourth turning is here book. I haven't read that one yet. Um, so 2026, that seems just as good as any plus AI is going to be, um, reaching a fever pitch. Then, um, whatever happens is probably going to happen this year, next year, or the following year. 
Um, and then, of course, if it is a war, if it is a, a world war, those usually take three to five years to to wear out. And so, you know, we're right on schedule for whatever is going to happen. It's going to it's going to be done by 2030, I, I suspect. And then we're going to kind of go into that new high. It's going to be an, a, re a repeat of the post-war boom, the nifty 50s, you know, so on and so forth. But in the meantime, status games will tighten. And so what I mean by that is you're going to get more and more misinformation, disinformation. We're going to have informant culture the same way that Nazi Germany had informant culture of, you know, children tattling on their parents for not being loyal to the party. You already see this with Donald Trump ba basically doubling down and focusing on loyalty above all else. Um, you're going to see this as, you know, informing based on using TikTok and that sort of thing. I think that it's going to look a little bit different. Um, because with the internet, there's so much more transparency. And I think that, I think that the, that the culture war is more going to be waged on digital battlegrounds with misinformation campaigns and those sorts of things. Um, there are, there are some things that are obviously like troll farm bots on my YouTube comments that I see. Some of them are more sophisticated. Who knows? Um, it could also be, it could also be false positives. Um, but you know, nationalism and then us versus them thinking is also going to increase, uh, again, this is I'm not I'm not saying I endorse this. This is just the pattern. Um, this is just how things kind of tend to to go out. The biggest risk of war is the U.S. versus China. Now, it's entirely possible that this plays out exactly how U.S. versus Soviet Union played out for you know several decades, where it was a lot of low intensity proxy wars, um, and, and especially over the last few months, as I saw uh, U.S. and China um, both doing war games. And then the rhetoric cooled off drastically after they both did war games. I think that they both realized that a hot war, basically nobody wins a hot war between America and China. And so they're like, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's calm down. And even China, um, as of this week, they're calling for all nuclear armed powers to have a, um, to adopt a formal policy of no first use for nuclear weapons. Now, I don't know if we can trust China to say that, but at least that's what they're saying. Um, it would be nice if if we could, but of course, you know, America does not have a no first use policy. So, you know, it it would be hypocritical of of us to you know criticize them when they have a publicly and explicitly adopted a no first use policy, and we haven't. I personally think that an, a no first use policy um, would be good, but there's something. What was it called? It's called strategic uh, strategic ambiguity. So the name of the game for America right now is strategic ambiguity, which is why we never fully commit. To saying, you know, we will defend Taiwan to the last man. We say, we like Taiwan and let them try and figure it out. So that strategic amb ambiguity is actually the explicit policy of the State Department. Now, I do suspect that the, that the major state powers are going to shy away from nuclear and biological warfare, particularly with the pandemic, which what I, I, I'm pretty sure the, the evidence is there that it was a lab leak. I don't think it was a bioweapon lab leak. I think it was just a, a, a lab leak. But people realize that bioterrorism and, and biological warfare is completely indiscriminate and nobody wins. Um, so I don't think any sane person would use would use that. Uh, so and that's the kind of thing if it does happen, like game's over. Um, if nuclear war does happen, game's over. But I think um, what we're seeing on the battlefield in uh, in Ukraine is that drone and cyber warfare are probably going to be front and center um, for the next several decades or at least the the, the new paradigm. So what comes next? If we survive this, if we get to 2030, what comes next? The, the two things is new paradigms and new institutions. And so if we if we look to history as as um, as a way of, uh, you know, kind of predicting the future. Now, again, the paradigms are different every every site, every time the cycle repeats. But we know we can kind of, you know, create classifications of we know what's going to change or, or at least we know which sectors are going to change. We don't necessarily know how they're going to change. So social paradigms are going to change. We're already seeing this with, you know, uh, orientations toward gender, religion, tolerance, sexuality, that sort of stuff. Um, the In the fourth turning, he says that, uh, I don't remember exactly, but like during some of those different cycles, you see tightening of gender gaps and then widening of gender gaps. You see tightening of racial relations and then broadening of, of racial relations. But you can expect some trends to change or reverse. And I think an example of what this actually looks and feels like is how um, how the basically the entire left or liberal of America like went into a death spiral because of the Israel Gaza thing, where you have um, some liberals like you know just throwing in and saying Gaza is completely right, and because it's they're looking for like 
a victim victor mentality. Um, they're looking for a bully, like an aggressor and a, and a victim. Um, and they're trying to think in, in very black and white terms. And that's just true of young people in general. Young people tend to think more in black and white terms. Um, so, it, and that's not, that's not to criticize. That's just, okay. If someone looks like they're, they're the victim, maybe, you know, the bully and on paper on numbers, like, yeah, Israel is definitely the bully, especially when you look at last I heard it was like 27,000 civilians killed mostly women and children. Like, yeah, that doesn't look good. That's, that's a bad look as the kids say. Um, we're going to see political changes as well, na namely the end of gerontoc gerontocracy um, is one of the things because just by virtue, by dint of the fact that boomers are going to be aging out, um, they're going to be replaced by mostly millennials. Um, and the reason is because Gen X is a much smaller generation, but also because of because they are coming from the nomad generation, they're kind of disinterested. They're kind of cynical and disinterested. And that's not to say that, like, if you're a member of Gen X, you don't care about politics. That's not really what I mean. But just numerically speaking, there are far more millennials. And they're also because they have more decades of kind of being trapped, being stuck in a survival mode. They're kind of just like, you know, like, eh, whatever, it'll it'll play out. I don't really care. It's not my thing. But us millennials and us younger people, we're fired up like we're we're angry and we want we want to make things change. Um, and so that's that's kind of what I mean there. For spirituality, it's it's not yet clear how that's going to play out. We're definitely seeing more reconstructionism and revivalism. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. You know, there's already like robo theocracy, you know, kind of um, in the in the in the comments where people like want to worship Roko's, Roko's basilisk and that sort of thing. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, economic paradigms, those are all going to be shattered, and I've talked about that quite extensively, so I don't need to need to rehash that. Um, but I think you guys get the point. Um, yeah, so that is that. That's the presentation. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing, and we'll move over to Q and A. So, also, um, there's a, there's only a few questions in the Q and A, so make sure everyone is using the Q and A button to to launch their questions and also um, upvote the questions that they want to get answered. Um, let me also check the comments to see what people are talking about. Yeah, all right, Philippines, Taiwan, Venezuela. Let's see. But interestingly, Chinese are the largest wave of Southern. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let me check on the Q&A. All right. So Daryl's question was the first one, and it has one upvote. Um, let's see. I'm not familiar with the University of Maryland, um, so I can't really say anything specific. Um, but Daryl, did you have a specific question here? Let me Let me invite you up to speak. Daryl. All right, Daryl, what's your question? Hey, Dave, I just wanted to ask about, you know, with, with um, yeah, I, the UMD project, sure. how Hi. much of an impact will it impact um, about what you're talking about with uh, humanity and stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with the project. So can you give me a little bit of background? There, it's, it's, a, it's a huge project working on, on industry and how to regulate AI um, in regards to what Biden is proposing um, in his AI um, uh, policies, mm. so it's 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 pretty much a global effort um, from a project management perspective um, with the U.S. So it's a U.S. effort right now. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm I'm not familiar with the details, um, but I, what I can say is that many many universities around the world, as well as policy people. Um, inside governments are also working on some of these um, some of these frameworks. Are you do you know any of the kind of principles or tenants that they're that they're proposing? More towards um, leaning towards um, using Microsoft products with a security feature since you know the US government heavily uses Microsoft with uh, with, with with specific projects. Mm. Um, and mainly ethics as far as what they want to pretty much cover with how, how ethics needs to be incorporated in, in most businesses or in all businesses um, right in the world yeah okay so so that those kinds of policies are operating within the container of established frameworks and so what i mean by that is is the way that it's described in for instance in the fourth turning is that you have people that are not ready to yet embrace fundamentally new approaches and paradigms. And so because of that, talking about the ethics of using an AI tool as if it is just another AI tool fails to fully take into account the fact that it is going to disrupt 
every assumption that we have about how technology works and and um how like how to even handle it so yeah you can talk about ethics it's it's not a bad conversation to have um but it still falls very 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 far short of the conversations that need to be happening in government um with respect to breaking assumptions that we have about you know employment for instance breaking assumptions that we have about corporatism for instance breaking assumptions that we have about capitalism so any conversation that falls short of that is going to um intrinsically come up short in the long run unfortunately you are absolutely 100 percent correct uh, because even uh talking about ethics in ai for project management it's kind of taboo at this point especially with uh how AI is rapidly growing. Yep. It's really interesting. Yep. Yeah, no. And it, 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 here's the thing is reality will assert itself eventually because, you know, the understanding the, the status quo and, you know, the establishment always wins. And um, that is the safest assumption because for most of history and, and actually Ray, both Ray Dalio and the authors of the fourth turning talk about this. Um, and when, when they talk about like the assumptions, because most people only see one major paradigm shift in their entire life. And then they kind of assume that the world will always be like that at forever and ever afterwards. Also, Jonathan, I see that you raised your hand, um, but I got, you got to, um, add in a question under the QA tab and then, uh, and you can also advocate if you want to get your, your question upvoted. Um, but yeah, I didn't want you to just sit there with your hand, hand raised. Um, yeah. And so it's not it's not really any um anyone's fault because it's like you know you only live through one world war ii in your lifetime now granted some people saw both world war one and world war ii um, but then it's been it's been 80 years since the end of world war ii nobody really alive today has seen the whole the whole thing the whole picture um the whole cycle and only the oldest people have seen the cycle but you know the oldest people that are in office are joe biden and donald trump and nancy pelosi and those sorts of people and they're a little bit out of touch like all of them i'm not really a fan of any of them uh, but again they also have decades and decades of kind of this this status quo that they're familiar with so good question daryl all right let's get see who's next whoops there we go. All right, let's see who's next. Do a refresh. All right, Will, I see you got a you got you got some upvotes. And Eric, I see that you raised your hand. Make sure you do uh you use the QA tab. Oh, I see you have a question asked. Um, but you'll need to get you'll need to get some upvotes if you want to talk with people in the chat. All right. Let's see who's next. Will is next. All right. Will, come on up. What you got? Hey, how you doing? Good. How you been? Good. Excellent. I was, uh, what are some potential spiritual ramifications, both beneficial and detrimental, that you envision in the realm of radical life extension? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. So, you know, I, I haven't asked this question publicly yet. Um, and it's partly because usually I come up with a better question or I haven't f fully formed this question yet. But, you know, some people and it's a pretty common refrain, which is that death is what gives life meaning. And I don't really believe in that. That just sounds like pure cope to me. Um, you know, it's like death is a fact of life. Yes. Um, but I don't know that death is what confers meaning to life. The fact that there is a definite bookend to life. Um, but with that in mind. If you no longer have the expectation that you'll die one day, you know, except by accident, like every everyone on a long enough timeline, everyone will die, right? Even if you become functionally immortal, the universe will probably end at some point. Um, and so even if you live, you know, 11 quintillion Google years or whatever, it's going to be finite. But chances are, statistically speaking, like you're going to get caught in a supernova before that happens. Excuse me. Still a little congested from that sinus infection I had. Um, so what happens in the, in the short term is, and I actually talked about this on a few podcasts uh, last year, is when you have radical life extension, for the first few decades, nobody's really going to notice. And the reason nobody's really going to notice is because our time horizon, basically like our ability to think about our future and our fate, 
only extends about a year or two into the future. Beyond that, it's like, hey, I know that I'm not in any mortal peril right now, so I'm probably going to be fine. Most people don't really live that far in the future. And even people with stuff like health anxiety, um, like Brian Johnson, that millionaire who spends like, a, you know, $2 million a year, um, he's reacting to another kind of anxiety, another kind of, it's more of a body, it's an embodied kind of anxiety. He's not actually worried about dying next year. What he's responding to is a very immediate form of anxiety, which is like, what's wrong with my body? What's going on right now? Um, but in the long term, once, you know, grandchildren grow up and, you know, grandma and grandpa and mom and dad all look the same age and I look at the same age, that's when we're really going to see some social and spiritual changes. And it's really going to start dawning on people. Oh yeah. Like this is something new. And like one of the comments that came up was like, you know, if people are living, you know, if, if we hit, hit indefinite lifespan, is it going to be like people that are 120 years old dating someone who's 40 years old and you can't tell the difference in anyways, cause they're all functionally 25. Um, that's going to be a, something that happens. And, and I do suspect on a social level, there will still be differences because like the amount of life experience that you have at 125, still very different than how much you have it at, you know, 45 years old. Um, but with those longer lifespans, one of the worst things that I'm that I'm afraid of is is one accumulation of power, because um, the longer you live, the more connections you have, the more wealth you have, the more power you can consolidate. That is that's more of a social thing. But on a on a spiritual or philosophical level is like, do people stagnate? Do they calcify? And what I mean by calcify is like, do you get just kind of stuck in your ways and then you live for you know decades and decades or centuries and centuries with the same beliefs? Um, and that, that could be bad. That could be destructive to society in terms of, in terms of like, does that mean more people will be Christian or less people will be Christian? You know, I, I don't really know. Like I, I do not have any framework to make that prediction other than like, I can, I can anticipate some of the risks. Now, if more people start doing psychedelics, I think that we're going to have a very, very different kind of, of religion and spirituality in the coming decades. Um, and I'm I'm kind of of the school of thought that that original Christian mysticism is entirely rooted in psychedelics. Um, you know, you, you the the evidence is there, both the anthropological and archaeological evidence is there that early Christianity, early Islam, and all the all the proto religions were all primarily shamanic, psychedelic based religions, and we're going through a psychedelic renaissance. And I think if I I, I don't know what it, where it's going to turn out, but I do think the psychedelic renaissance is going to be the biggest primary like influence so that's kind of that's kind of my my shtick what do you think about all that yeah no i i wholeheartedly agree um i'm a big fan of uh john Mar marco allegro um his book yeah I'm, I'm sure you know of it if you know about christian mysticism especially to do with psychedelic culture i haven't i i don't recognize the name but uh, uh what was the name of his book I, i'm pro i probably know what you're referring to by a different different name um let me hold on let me i have i have it um let me look real quick if you don't have it yeah you can just drop okay yeah I don't, yeah yeah john michael like i'll 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 drop it in the chat yeah cool but um yeah it had to do with um psilocybin mushrooms and around um the jesus story basically around that yep um and yeah. i think it had to do with that i believe it had to do with the dead sea scrolls as well yeah and the and Gnostic gospels Mm -hmm. I, I think it I think it probably goes back even older than that. If you look at the um like the Eleusinian mysteries, I mean, it goes back to the golden age of Athens, if not older, um, that there's a lot of influences even before, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth and stuff. And and Old Testament, you know, like uh, original Judaic myth mysticism that goes back five, six thousand years like that. I'm, there's <laughs> I think they were out in the desert tripping balls. Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of evidence for that um, intentionally or otherwise. So yeah, bur good stuff. burning bush was uh, an acacia tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where DMT is derived from, right? Um, yeah, that sounds about right. I don't know. I don't know the specifics off the top of my head, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I believe it is. Thank oh, you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. All right. Let's see who's next. Hit refresh. All right, Matt Nelson, you got a question. Let me bring you on up, Matt. All right, Matt, what's your question? Hey, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. All right, so this was just a response to when you were talking about the book and you were talking about all the all the research that went into it, all the data 
that the author sort of put together and laid out. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it is pretty clear to see these patterns. Um, but my, I guess what I was thinking though, is that um, I have a hard time relying on the past data to like divine where the patterns are leading um, just given the state of AI right now and the right. fact you know, it's going to disrupt everything, like we said, and it's like so many different changes at once is it just seems like so unpredictable um, that I feel like none of these past indicators, even though they're well researched, um, seem that relevant. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. No. And th so that's that's where I was. And I'm and I don't disagree because, you know, when we talk about breaking paradigms and, and coming up with fundamentally new you know, modes of reality. Yes, it's entirely possible that every past assumption is going to be wrong. Uh, particularly, you know, when we look at can machine replace human labor, eminently, it seems possible. Okay, well, humans have been responsible for most labor for most of existence. So we don't have a model for that. So you're absolutely right. Um, now, at the same time, in 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 these books, they talk about how people in the past have also assumed that something is going to change forever or that we're at the end times and that, and that yes, there is chaos and that, that your way of life is fundamentally dying out. You know, that goes back to that Vesperance term that, you know, nostalgia for, for right now where we recognize that we're the last of an era, right? That like, that's that, that everything is going to change. And so change, I think is probably the only thing that we can all agree on. Um, but, and, and by virtue of that change, then everything that we know today and familiar and, and are familiar with today is dying out. It's kind of like, you know, the, the person you are today is not the person you are tomorrow. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like there's only so much that we can divine from, from these patterns. I did find it very helpful to understand that like, okay, technology is the only thing that's really kind of fundamentally changing human biology and human evolution. That's relatively fixed, particularly in this time scale. And so that's, when, when I read Ray Dalio's thing and said, okay, you know, this, these are aggregate behaviors based on economics. And then I read the fourth turning, which is an intergenerational uh, pattern. I said, okay, we can probably rely on the human factor because, you know, humans are flawed and messy, um, but we're, and we're also predictable. So the, the wild card here is the technology though. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, it also made me think about how you were talking about the stagnation problem with longevity. Mm. Uh, it feels like, it's kind of on us like as a society to make stagnation into a like like a social faux pas basically right like whether it's yeah. legal or not you know it should be socially illegal just like <laughs> you know drinking and driving that sort of thing right because everybody who embraces stagnation and says well i just am who i am <clears throat> you know i'm not going to change i'm done you know progressing right i'm old now like that is toxic to everybody, right? It's in everybody's right. best interest to sort of socially pressure that person away from that that ideology. I agree somewhat, but the, so there's there's one major silver lining with people living longer, and that is having a longer cultural memory. And so, in some respects, like let's say let's say so here's here's kind of the thought experiment that I did which is all right so let's let's assume that the fourth turning is correct and that there's four primary intergenerational archetypes there's probably more i mean he 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 unpacks that there's other models some that say that there's you know 3 or 5 or 8 or whatever but the idea is that there's a finite number of like intergenerational archetypes now instead of them aging out uh, imagine that they all stay and so imagine that we have the heroes the prophets, the artists, and the nomads all living side by side. Yes, there's going to be some fragmentation because a lot of people get kind of stuck in their ways and their beliefs. And they're like, ah, you know, like, for instance, my my ex-wife's uh, grandmother was in, in Russia during the famines and she watched her little brother starve to death. And that shaped her forever. She's never going to forget that. I mean, she the grandmother has since died. But imagine that she was still alive and young today, you know, an, an active voter and still part of the family and was going to be alive for the next several centuries, she will always remember like Soviet communism and famines and central management are bad. And she'll have that lived experience and that living memory of how things could go horribly wrong. And so while, while that stagnation could be problematic, it could be difficult, especially if we get 
if we get stagnation around really important social values like racism and sexism and you know everything you know those those kinds of things all the isms um but at the same time that living memory i think is going to do society um more good than harm um now could it be that the that the same medicines and the same procedures that give us rejuvenation also make our brains more flexible i think so cuz you know like part part of the way that you measure neurological age is lack of cognitive flexibility well if you reverse that then like if everyone is as mentally flexible as they were when they were 25 like i don't I, it might not be a problem it could be a moot point so yeah those I, are, I agree i would, yeah. i was thinking that too that you know sort of being younger gives us the younger brains and sort of makes us more you know like prone to doing that so that does give me hope too yep yeah and 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 as someone mentioned in the comments it it should be up to choice right you know individual liberty personal freedom um if someone wants to be stuck in their ways great um but and as you said in some cases if you have like t today for instance you know if you have really overtly sexist or racist views you're going to kind of get cast out of mainstream society like you'll you'll have your own little echo chamber but like you won't be welcome in a lot of places um, if you if you maintain those problematic beliefs. But you're welcome to, you know, everyone is welcome to their beliefs. It's just there's also going to be consequences. So, yeah, good, good stuff. Any any final points? Uh, no, that's it. I feel like I've taken enough of your time. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. All right. Let's see who's next. And uh, folks, remember, you can um, you can jump in on uh on the the q a and and add questions and i see someone uh someone anonymous um asked a question if you if this was you um you can talk but i'm not going to make anyone talk who doesn't want to um so jump in the chat if you want to talk you can you should be able to unicast me directly um but i'll go ahead and answer this since nobody is volunteering all right so the question from anonymous is with the creation of asi from tech companies won't they become the most powerful being on earth then? Isn't, isn't that an issue? So I'll say sort of. And the reason that I say sort of is because this kind of requires us to make some assumptions about what ASI is and what it does and how it works. And so ASI, artificial superintelligence, it's probably not going to be a single atomized entity. It's not going to be one robot or one data center. It's going to be a collection of models. It's going to be a collection of data centers. It's going to be a collection of hardware. So it's intrinsically decentralized. It's intrinsically distributed. Now, you might say, okay, well, yeah, but Microsoft and Google and, you know, Apple and all of them, they're going to control it. Sort of. Like, yes, they might have, they might have some control over the foundational training of the models and that sort of thing. But there's also going, they're not just going to be running it for themselves. They're going to be selling those services. Those services are going to be powering a lot of other services and products. And so you have this really like broad marketplace. And, and also it's not going to just be one model. It's going to be at first, you know, we have, we already have hundreds of models, thousands of models. It, before too long, we're going to have millions and billions of different models of different agents of different strengths and weaknesses and costs and benefits and those sorts of things. And so this is why I've been talking about the digital super organism model of kind of understanding what is it that we're creating. And, you know, it's not, it, it when you see in fiction, like the one Skynet, um, that's one that's not likely from just a development standpoint, creating one single self-contained entity that is that big and that powerful is just impractical. The reason that it's done, though, is for a narrative purposes. It's easier to have one nebulous, you know, Skynet. Um, but that's probably not going to be how it emerges. Instead, it's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies, some with open source, some with closed source. You're going to have data centers. You're going to have smaller versions that can run on your phone. You can have nodes at your at your home office or whatever, and, and every business is going to have their own. Every country is going to have their own. There's going to be some international models. And so when you when you realize that we're actually going into this really big divergence in terms of how AI is going to be created, implemented, and trained, really looking at, at it in terms of aggregates and in terms of incentive structures, that's really, to me, a better way of looking at it. Um, so I hope that helps helps it make sense in terms of how it's going to be. And this is why I really, in the particularly in my video this morning, 
I mentioned that I'm really glad that at least Mark Zuckerberg is in favor of open source models. Um, I hope that more are, but of course there are some companies like Anthropic and Mistral and, and others that are just intrinsically open source. Now, some of them are going to go one way or the other. And even Sam Altman has been asked directly at a few interviews, like, hey, are you going to open source your, your older models? And he's like, we might do it at some point. It's like, well, hopefully. Um, but either way, you know, Eleuther AI and Conjecture and all these other ones, um, that are kind of more intrinsically open source. I suspect that we're going to always have a balance of open source and closed source, but it's also like, you know, compute hardware is going to be everywhere and these models are going to be everywhere. And so it's, it's not going to be just one monolith. It's, it, it was never going to be one monolithic, um, entity. It's always, it was always going to be decentralized and distributed. Um, but that means that there's a, it's an entirely new set of complexity theory and game theory in order to understand how do you shape this, how do you shape the incentives um, so that it evolves in a way that is beneficent for humanity. And that's that's kind of the central part of my work. So that's a that's a good question. I hope I I hope I answered it. Um yeah. So cool. Let's see who's next. All right. Gustavo, what should children learn today? Let me ask, bring you up. Oh, Gus. Oh, did he might have left? I don't see someone with the same name who's still in. Whoops, come back. QA. Yeah, it looks like it looks like the guy who asked this question left. Um, so the the question is, what should children learn that are born today? And so my I've I've solidified around this answer, and it's it's probably a little bit disappointing to some people, um, but it's people skills, uh, relationship skills, people skills, communication, negotiation. Those are far and away going to be the most important skills. They're already the most valuable skills for all all people, um, because every so when I started investing, you can see some of the some of the like communication and relationship books right over my head. Um, when I started investing in people skills, my career took a very different turn. Um, that's how you get into like upper management. That's how you get into leadership. That's how you get investors. Um, that's uh, but but also. Every time I learned something for a relationship with my now wife, it applied directly to uh, work. And so then it's like, okay, well, if you imagine we're heading towards a post-labor future or or a meaning economy or or you know a status economy, how do you how do you generate meaning? And so my model for for the meaning economy is REM, relationships, experiences, and mission. And so relationships far and away give you the most amount of meaning in your life. And this is true for, for all people across all time, all humanity. Um, and only it, once I, once I was thinking about that, I was like, all the, all the people who are strong nihilists that I know, they're all very lonely people. Um, and that's, that's not to say, oh, well, if you're lonely, you're, you're a nihilist, or if you're a misfit, you're a nihilist. But I'm just saying like, if you don't have, if you don't get meaning from relationships because of, you know, whatever reason, because of the generation you're part of, or because of isolation or whatever, then yeah, nihilism seems more appropriate to you. But for people with lots of healthy relationships, they just, nihilism doesn't make any sense. And biologically, neurologically speaking, you get most of your meaning from relationships. You also get meaning from unique novel experiences. And finally, you get meaning from uh, from having mission or purpose in your life. And that can be any number of things. It can be everything from you want to clean up a river that you love. It could be being a good parent. It could be what my mission is, which is why I'm here today. Um, but yeah, so so the underpinning for all of that is communication skills and people skills. And I will add systems thinking. Systems thinking is in incredibly valuable for any of those, whether you want to systematically approach um, you know, creating new relationships or meetup groups or co cohabitation, whatever. Um, if you want to, you know, uh, pursue any mission, uh, systems thinking is good for, for any kind of, any kind of big mission, the bigger the mission, the more systems thinking you need and that sort of thing. So good question. I hope, I hope that you, whoever asked that, I, I hope either you're on here or you get to hear it on the recording. Who got to catch my breath. All right. Anonymous asks again, this was what is upvoted with impending economic shifts on the horizon. What pivotal changes and niches in AI should we watch and what strategies uh, can startups employ to thrive? So I don't know if I have quite enough context for this. I'm going to have to make some assumptions as to what you meant. Um, but let's see. Let me unpack this. So ec economic shifts on the horizon. Yes, I agree with that. 
pivotal changes and niches in AI should we watch? So the first thing is going to be the impact of robotics. So we're, you know, agents are on the rise right now. We can kind of anticipate what agents are going to do. The rule of thumb is if you can do it on a computer, an agent's going to be able to do it. In many cases, the agents are already good at doing a lot of things that you can do on a computer. Um, robots is kind of the big wild card because some people are predicting like, oh, well, there's going to be limitations of the hardware or, you know, a, a, a robot that is as dexterous as a human is just going to be too expensive or you know, maybe maybe the fine motor dexterity means that robots are never going to be able to do uh, electricians work or plumbers work or that sort of thing. I don't know that I believe that because when you consider that most of the the most precise machining that is done is already done by robots. So machines can do super hyper precise machining and super hyper precise tasks. Then you just attach that to a humanoid robotic chassis. I don't see what the problem is. Um, so that's that's that. And then if you're a startup. The, the startups that I see that are doing the best, it's it's the combination of AI expertise and subject matter expertise. And so what I mean by that is an example is um, one of the best examples is case law. So case law uh, or case text, case text, case text is the name of the startup. And so that was a bunch of lawyers who understood, um, you know, what goes into uh, re researching case law. And then they just pointed all the, you know, rag and 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 large language models at it. And now my lawyer friends that, that use that, it's like, oh, well, we don't need to hire paralegals. We just use this service for $20 a month or however. It's probably more than that because it's for law. Um, but when you, when, you, when you combine that deep subject matter expertise with AI expertise, those are the startups that are doing best right now. Now, again, if you don't have the right business model or the right th niche, then like you could get nuked from orbit, just like we've seen with a lot of the creative ones. Um, that it's just like, oh, hey, like, you know, chat GPT, the new version completely killed everything that you were working on. And that's still possible, although that kind of trend has slowed down. So that's a good question. I hope that answers your question um, with respect to uh, the, the coming changes. All right, let's see who's next. Luke, looks like you're up. Actually, no, Eric, I know you asked this question a while ago, so we'll we'll get Eric up. Excuse me, I got hiccups. I had a had a fast lunch with my friend earlier. All right. Eric, let's get you up. All right, Eric, what you got? You're muted. There you go. Mm, still can't hear you. You might have a hardware level mute mute on your, your microphone. Did we skip Matt? Um, all right, Eric, we'll bring you back up. Take a take take some time to figure out your your microphone. Do 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 do. Okay, let's see who's next. George, uh, Matt was up a little while ago. Um, all right, who's next? We got Luke. We'll get Luke up. Oh, you're fine, George. You can catch it in the recording if uh, if you missed it. All right, Luke, what's your question? Hey, Dave. Uh, I'm just wondering. I mean, I know this, uh, obviously there's so many variables on how this could, you know, turn out. But, like, say, say there was a war in the future. I mean, you know, the, the first thing I'm thinking is, like, especially with AI and, and robotics and stuff, I'm assuming that countries are going to be less likely to actually put, you know, humans on the ground. Um, I mean, even nowadays, I mean, I'm sure that's, I don't know the statistics, but I'm sure it's pretty slim, but, you know, I'm wondering like, what do you think that would look like? You know, do you think it would be like, say U.S. and China, like, what do you think the likelihood would be that it would actually be direct fighting between U.S. and China or more of like multiple smaller proxy wars? Yeah. So proxy wars are, are kind of the thing that you see. And so for with U.S. and China, well, I think what we're I think the flashpoint is going to be the South China Sea um, because it's like, you know, there's Vietnam and the Philippines and Japan kind of all like vying for control over that. And there are there are uh, geological reasons like um, geography is destiny um, with respect to geopolitics and war. And China is hemmed in by the by the first and second island chains, as well as by India. And as well as by Siberia. Now, if Russia collapses, then 
I wouldn't be surprised if China just annexes most of of that side of Russia, honestly. Um, and it would make sense for them to do that if they could do it without triggering a major war. But Russia can't defend its borders. Um, and that's a lot of land um, that would help China get access to more natural resources and more deep water ports uh, in the long run. Now, that is that is like... It's not a guarantee that Russia is going to disintegrate further. There's a lot of people predicting it. There's a lot of people saying that's nonsense. It could go either way, I think, is kind of the, the takeaway. Um, whenever, whenever there's that much disagreement, it means that there's no certainty. Likewise, even if that did happen, it's anyone's guess as to whether or not China would take advantage of that. Now, in the, in the medium term, you have China with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is trying to get more geopolitical power across the Middle East and Africa, and also South America. That's not part of the Belt and Road Initiative, but China is doing their, their debt trap diplomacy in South America as well. And when you look at the pattern, the reason that China is going for all those places is because they're more vulnerable, because there's less economic power to be had there. And so then the way that I've come to understand it is China's feeling around. They're hemmed in on a lot of sides. And so they're making alliances with, with countries that are not economic powerhouses and never, well, I'm not going to say never will be, but won't be in the foreseeable future. And then they're, they're, they're taking these physical approaches like the Belt and Road Initiative because they can't project enough power to control the South China Sea totally or, you know, get past Japan and that sort of thing. And so it's like, if you think of it as like kind of an amoeba sending out feelers in every direction, they're just sending out feelers in every direction and grabbing whatever power they can. And so I suspect that we're going to see very, very similar kind of proxy wars to the same that we saw, like, you know, the first Vietnam War, um, the same in Afghanistan repeatedly, um, that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, I was just rewatching Ghost in the Shell with my wife, and they said that, you know, there was the second Vietnam War and World War Four, And so the Japanese have been predicting this for a long time. I'm not saying that like Vietnam is going to be, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that like, oh, the, you know, world war four is going to take place in Vietnam. I'm just pointing out that that is that that kind of proxy war, because the first Vietnam war was a proxy war, by the way, um, that that kind of thing is probably going to be uh, the, you know, the, the kind of the de facto, the status quo for the foreseeable future. Um, now, in terms of how that battle looks in terms of, in terms of how it's fought, like we're we're already seeing that that Ukraine is having great success using drones against even you know fleets, um like the the Russia's Black Sea fleet is basically decimated by by drone boats, um and then it, Russia's tank uh, battalions are invalidated by drones, um and and the range of drones is also going up crazy high like hundreds of miles, um so you know small fast discreet quiet. Um, that's that's the name of the game. Uh, now, is that really going to change the broader geopolitical land? Like, no, power power remains relatively static. Um, and what I mean by that is is kind of what I said, which is uh, geography is destiny. You know, it's like if you've got the arable land, if you've got the if you've got the deep water ports, if you've got the forest land, um, those sorts of things. That that still seems like the primary determinant of culture and the outcomes of war. Um, I don't I don't remember who it was, but someone said, uh, I, I don't care. I don't care about, you know, soldiers and tanks and mines. Tell me tell me the banks, whoever has the most financial power wins the war. And that was someone talking about, I think, World War One or World War Two. Um, so, you know, when you when you look at the fundamentals, China just doesn't hold a candle to America alone, let alone all of our allies. You know, China, uh, sorry, Japan, Australia, Europe, um, India. And India, I know, like India has to be very careful because of where they are uh, uh, geographically speaking. So they often will kind of equivocate. They won't explicitly come out against Russia and China. Um, but yeah, so that's that's uh, that's kind of my take. What are your what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, no, it make it makes total sense. I mean, the the one thing I'm thinking now when you were talking about you know drones, I'm wondering on the good side of things, I wonder if the advancements in technology would actually make, well, I know cleaner is not the right word, but like eliminate some um, like civilian deaths. Like I wonder, like as the military technology gets more advanced, maybe we're more likely to see like specific smaller military installations taken out instead of like, oh, you know, just wipe out this whole entire area. 
Yeah. So, well, there's there's a few things with respect to population. All nations are falling way short of their of their recruiting quotas because uh, because young people today are um, either too too out of shape, addicted to drugs, or too anxious and depressed. And so the number of people that are physically and mentally fit for service is is dwindling drastically. And this is not just America or China. This is everywhere. Um, and so they're looking at shoring up um, uh, that that deficit with automation, with robotics, with drones. And it's by virtue of the fact that they have to. Um, and, and eventually, because of that demographic uh, decline, we're going to see the same thing in industry. Um, as some people in the comments today pointed out, uh, there's already talent gaps um, all over the world, all over all over the industry, um, which is making it harder for a lot of companies to hire. And then you say, OK, well, the, the, the demographic dividend is ending for places like China. It's actively ending right now. It already ended a while ago for Japan and Italy and that sort of thing. Um, and so it's like, oh, hey, your economy collapses if you don't have enough young people. Uh, and so there's two ways out of that. One is AI automation and robotics and two longevity. <laughs> and we need both of those. Um, now, now, if 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 suddenly you give someone a magic pill and it's like, oh, hey, you're going to be 25 for the rest of your life, they're less likely to want to go sh start shooting at someone. They're like, why don't we figure out how to get along instead? Um, so, yeah, uh, good good point all around. Thanks, Dave. All right, good questions. All right, uh, let's see, Eric. Let's see if you got your uh, microphone sorted out. Give me just a second. <laughs> All right. All right, Eric, come on up. Am I loud and clear? There we go. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. Hi, Dave. Um, so uh, I've been wanting to uh, bring this up here. Uh, I want to talk about um, specifically brain augmentation, like people's interest in brain augmentation, people wanting to live in VR, uh, virtual reality, you know, and gene editing. And I, I, help, I can't help but feel like this is all um, uh, kind of... Um, so sorry, I was getting distracted. Um, no worries. I, I can't help but feel like uh, these are all advocating for new, vastly different perceptions in reality, and and I feel like this this will uh, in the future will ensue like uh, very rap uh, radically different uh, perceptions and advocating for different. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um... No worries. What you got? <laughs> sorry, kind of stage fright. Um... <laughs> oh. It, yeah. Well, OK, so let me let me see if I understand. So your your question is about um, kind of the long term impacts of things like, you know, full dive VR and, and genetic manipulation and and kind of like, what does it mean to be human? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Um, yes. But um, basically, I want, uh, the question I wanted to ask is, how do you see like, harmony coming um, with between mm. all these different walks of life in the long term? Um, the, one of the one of the simplest things, and we already know this, is tolerance is we're we're in a we're in a paradigm right now where people want to control each other and we see this in america both on the right and the left where um the left wants to police speech and and you know ban ban certain ideas and and censor certain things and the right wants to ban and certain censor uh, entirely different things for different reasons but it's the same behavior and so you know some of some of the religious right are saying like oh we want to make um, homosexuality go away. We want to make casual sex go away. They want to enforce their their generally you know Christian worldview on everyone else. And then likewise, you know the 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 far left wants to kind of inflict the same thing, uh, police other people's speech, um, and that sort of stuff. And we already know the principle, which is just tolerance, which is just live and let live. Um, and by by a, by by holding some of those ideals as as higher principles is is um, is is individual liberty uh equality before the law and the rest of it you just let it sort itself out you let people be how they are and one thing that i think might happen is uh, what i hope happens is as we get towards more post-labor economics obviously some people will always spend time on the internet but i'm just thinking like man if if all of my friends were were and and if we were all retired I would spend very, very little time on the internet. Like I would I watch the occasional, uh, you know, YouTube video. I would play some games with my friends, but mostly I would be like, you know, hanging out with my niece. Um, I'd be hanging out with my wife. I'd be traveling. 
and I'd be I'd be more anchored in in real life. Um, and I think that that's going to be a big thing is is people are going to realize the world is big and complicated. Um, and especially as we have AI agents that can interact with the internet on our behalf, we'll just like you know what, just tell me just tell me what's relevant, just tell me what I care about, and and to hell with the rest. Um, now, obviously, some people will not make that choice, but some people will. Um, but I, and I think that if we just if we valorize, if we say you know what, tolerance, equality before the law, live and let live. If we just say those are the chief principles, and we trust that everything else is going to work out, I think that I think that people will realize the stakes are not as high as they need to be and to stop making things worse. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, no, uh, I agree. Um, I think, and like you said, as like communication becomes more relevant and becomes key to, you know, humans existence. Um, yeah. I, I feel like uh, and so a lot of people I've noticed um, are already on that boat, you know? Yep. So I, yeah, I, I no, think... yeah. It's, it's communication, people skills, uh, systems thinking, and then I guess maybe, maybe civics and, and, you know, principles or, and ethics or whatever. Um, yeah. Good question. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. Let's get back over to the Q and A. See who's up. All right. So whoever this anonymous person is that's asking questions, you're getting all the upvotes. So you're asking good questions. Um, all right. So anonymous asks, uh, what actions should individuals take now to maximize personal benefits from AI and ascend socially, thereby tapping into the new generational wealth created by AI advancements? So I will differentiate. So my 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 immediate off the cuff thing is there's a difference between generational wealth and social ascent. And so what I'm doing, being here and with 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 everyone and, and on YouTube, that is that is part of the social ascent. And so that is that is um, playing a new status game. Now in terms of wealth, I am not like I, I I am behind in terms of where I should be in terms of wealth. Um I I'm doing better than many people, but I'm certainly not in like in the top bracket. Um, and if you want to maximize and capture wealth, like I do have friends that are my age that have like, you know, one of my friends has a, has a, has a, a beach house and owns like at least two or three businesses. And I'm just like, damn girl, what are you doing? Um, so, uh, if you want to maximize wealth, you need to get in on the bandwagon of the fourth industrial revolution technologies. Now, my, my, my value, my value, my wealth is in my public reputation. So that's what I'm going to parlay with, you know, like my books and my YouTube channel and everything else. Um, excuse, need some water. Give me just a second. Um, so there are two different things. And so this is where I've talked about the, the meaning economy is part of what's changing as well as the status economy. And so those are two kind of ways of looking at it. So the meaning economy is about, having a career or occupation that is tied to human meaning. So that's human to human interaction, whether it's experiences, remember relationships, experiences, and mission. So if you can help people with that, which is what that, that's what I do. I am, I'm like, I'm part of the meaning economy. I'm part of the next wave. Um, if you can help people with that, you'll be okay financially. Um, but then also if you can participate directly in a fourth industrial revolution technology, that's where you can get the more material wealth. Um, is that the right way to go? I don't know, but that's, that's kind of where where I see it going. Good question. Um, all right, let's see who's up. So it looks like we're a little bit running out of steam. Some of these questions aren't getting upvoted. So I know people are still hanging out. So check check out on the QA and upvote any questions that you want to get that you want to get answered. Uh, but it looks like Pablo's is is next. So let's get Pablo up. <clears throat> all right, Pablo, what you got? Hi, Dave. <laughs> yeah, Hello. so this is more like a personal question, actually. I'm not native English speaker. Okay. So when you mention, for example, yeah, English skills is something that you have to develop. I'm quite confused first of communication skills, maybe is just English focus or more broad communication skills. Uh, uh, and this is related with AI, of course. Mm hmm and also I am interested in your view or or maybe your personal experience of how to handle these people skills and these kind of things and maybe contextualize with these new technologies. For example, I also have been developed some small applications to, for example, uh, correct grammar issues for mm. my personal takes with AI or maybe like just to um, 
split a pro a personal problem that I have had. So I yep. think uh, this could also leverage this development of his people's skills and personal skills. So yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, first, English is valuable. Um, English English is generally is generally valuable, but there are aspects of communicating with people with all humans that are universal. Um, just verbal communication skills, presentation skills, getting out in front of people like like I'm at now. Um, that is that is another example of people skills or communication skills that I that I'm talking about. Negotiation. Um, negotiation is a huge thing where particularly if you think in the future where you know your living situation might change or if there's new economic paradigms or, that are more communal or more decentralized, your ability to present your opinions and beliefs and facts and the ability to conduct meetings um, and those sorts of things like rhetorical skill, these are all universal skills regardless of what language you're using. And language might actually be a non-issue, particularly as real-time translation gets better, which means that like, you know, you could be communicating with me in your native language and I hear it with your voice, but in English and then vice versa, that's coming very, very soon. And I would, I would be shocked if this time next year, um, Zoom doesn't have that built in where it's just like everything I hear is in English and everything that you hear is in um, your native language, which I'm guessing is Spanish. I could be wrong. Um, but, you know, and that sort of thing is coming. So which language is less important than understanding the theory of mind. So like, you know, what hum like how humans tick and that sort of thing. And I saw that someone was asking for books. So um, I'll drop in chat the um, my book list. I just published it on GitHub. Um, it's literally every book that I've read. And there's a lot of negotiation books and, and communication and relationship books on there. Um, so let me drop that in chat and you can take a look at that if you want. Um, but yeah, so in terms of syst systematic about it, there's so there's basically theory and practice. That's that's all there comes down to. So you can read a book. Um, there's a bunch of books on communication and storytelling that I read. And then you just have to get out and practice. Um, but knowing what to practice and what to pay attention to is is invaluable. Um, and and I'm I'm not the same person that I was 10 years ago in terms of presentation skills and, and everything. Um, but yeah, so good question. Any any other parts of that you want to follow up on? Um, yeah, about the contextualization of these AI technologies, maybe it can help uh, into this process or how do you Yeah, think? yeah. So you mentioned that you solved your own problem. That's actually one of the number one cardinal rules is solve a problem that you have. Uh, and that that is a really good place to start. Have you read the book uh, Crossing the Chasm? Have you come across that one? No, no. Um, so if if you're trying to build an AI product, you need to read Crossing the Chasm. Um, like that will explain so much to you about how to get feedback on your product. Um, whether you have one user or 10 or 10 million, um, you need to integrate feedback quickly and iterate quickly. That is the number one most true thing. It has been true for the last 10 years and will, and is even more true now because iteration cycles have to be faster. Yeah. Someone just dropped a, a link to uh, crossing the chasm in the chat. So that is as a systematic approach. Like that is, that is, if you only read one book on technology and startups, that is the book you should read in my opinion. Um, and then, and then put it into practice. Uh, but yeah, since start with a problem, like solve your own problem as, as good as you can start there because you're not the only person with that problem. And that will allow you to carve out a really powerful market niche, but then it's just a matter of iterating and integrating that feedback and making sure that you can interpret that feedback, that data, that telemetry that you're getting and, and do experiments um, to make sure that the theory that you develop as to what is it that people are using and why, um, and and kind of double down on that. Nice. How's that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're, you're welcome. Good question. Good question. All right. I think uh, we've had a few more questions pop up. <laughs> uh, Kyle likes my reading list. Um, okay. So anonymous, man, you're on fire. I want to know who who this is. Ping ping me on on Discord or uh or Patreon because you're asking good questions. Okay, so this is a longer one. So anonymous asks, with endless life, how will the possibility of the immortal elite navigate the vast oceans of their memories, and what mechanisms might they employ to curate, suppress, or enhance recollection? Could we see the emergence of memory banks, selective memory editing, or the even the outsourcing of memories? to AI reshaping and, and uh, reshaping identity and personal history. So in the short term, 
I think that 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 just rejuvenation alone will probably enhance people's memory quite a bit. Um, there's even evidence that once you treat Alzheimer's, like in mouse models, they actually are able to retrieve memories that seemed like they were lost. And so I suspect that rejuvenation therapy alone will get us most of the way where we need to be. Um, now, in terms of, you know, how much memory you have, um, there's a book and it's actually on the reading list called The Forgetting Machine. And actually, human memory is remarkable because of how little you actually need to remember things. And so if you're familiar with programming, the way that human memory works, and it's not like it's not exactly like this. This is just a metaphor. Um, but human memories are sparse. And so this is actually where I got the idea of sparse priming representations was when you recall something, you're recalling bits and pieces. And so rather than remembering each scene in your life as one thing, you say, OK, this person. So it's like, here's my wife. And you have a she's one archetype in your 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 brain. One eidetic image is what some people call it. Um, and so there's you're, there's one representation of this person, and every memory you have of that person just references that one image. And so human memory is actually incredibly efficient. Um, and so some people think that there's actually no limit to human memory, um, except for you know old age and your your brain starts to decay. Now in terms of offloading, um, notebooks. Humans have been offloading memory for centuries. Um, there's, I mean, AI might be able to help. You know, if you have if you have an AI agent on your phone that listens to everything that you do. Um, but yeah, there's not really like, from a technological standpoint, like, you know, okay, you know, one one tool or another, they're pretty much interchangeable at this point. Um, let's see if there's any other thing. Let's see, memory banks. So yeah, like a journal is a memory bank. Selective memory editing. I don't think that's going to be necessary. Um, I think I think probably what will happen, and I saw this, I, it might have been in a uh, Love, Death, and Robots episode, um, but basically, like, some people live for live so long that you kind of forget your original who you were, but, like, that's not really going to happen for probably centuries until, like, you've been so far divorced from your childhood that those memories are no longer relevant, and so then, like, your your personal narrative of who you are is going to be, like, a rolling window of the last, like, 200 years or so. Um, the, I don't know if that's possible again, just, just rejuvenation therapy alone might make that not happen, but then also over the next 200 years, the amount of potential cognitive improvement through genetic manipulation, like, you know, your brain might be millions and millions of times more efficient than it is today or something. I don't know. So interesting question though. All right. I think I'll answer one more. It's only got two upvotes, but there's still plenty of people hanging in. So I will I will answer this one. So another one from Anonymous. Um, let's see. Do you think that there will be any geographic area that will be that will act as a neutral zone or mediating body in the coming conflict? Um, I mean, nations, not an institution. Yeah. So there's basic. I mean, the global South is probably going to be mostly untouched, with the exception of like you know. Um, some of Southeast Asia and India, I think India might be a conflict zone. Um, but most of South America, Australia, most of Africa, except for local civil wars and, 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 and those regional conflicts, most areas are probably going to be largely untouched um, by, by this coming conflict in the next five years, if I had to guess. Um, obviously, like, I, I can't tell the future. Um, but when you look at historically patterned, like, Calling World War One and World War Two World Wars was a little bit ambitious. Um, yes, it was in every hemisphere, but I mean, there were so many places that the war just did not come to. Um, now, if I had to say, like, if you're in Europe, like Sweden looks pretty safe. Sweden is Sweden is is uh, wedged between Norway and Finland, and geography is on Sweden's side. Also, Sweden has a really good um, military and and uh, and industrial base. Um, so Sweden, Switzerland, they're probably fine if you're in Europe, uh, just due to geography. Cause again, geography is destiny. Um, Australia being that most of it is empty. Um, if you live in the Australian outback or, you know, some of the more remote places on, in Australia, there's not much value there. Like, yes, there's still world war two wrecks and stuff off the coast of Australia, but there was not a whole lot of action seen, seen in Australia as far as, as far as I know. Um, and again, because there's not many resources there. Like, there's not much reason to go there. And there's also not that many people. I think Australia's population is, what, like 30 million or something like that? Um, so, you know, it's like, okay, 
uh, there's there's potential for solar farms. Um, but yeah, so that's 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 that. Um, there's lots of places, uh, but pay attention to geography, man. Uh, deep valleys, uh, high mountain ranges, big rivers. Like yeah, you can you can get pretty well insulated um, in places. So um, I think we'll call it a day there. Thanks everyone for jumping in and asking really good questions. This was a uh, super engaging. Um, I like I like uh, this new this uh, this new topic. So cheers everybody. Have a good have a good uh, good weekend. Happy Friday. All right. Oh, and I'll pub I'll publish the recording here soon too. It takes a couple hours to to process. All right. Bye everybody.